So this talk really came out of this tweet from Weld Pond back in October of this past year. He was talking about how manufacturers a lot of times uh, make legal threats to security researchers when they're disclosing vulnerabilities. And he was pointing out like, hey, consumers can't really make um, legal threats when they buy software and it's broken and something happens. They really don't have a voice and a way to use the legal system right now. I was like, yes, having just gone through a few years of law school, I understand why, but it's kind of complicated. Um, and I thought it might be interesting to sort of explain to people why that is. And there's a lot of talk these days about software product liability. Last year's Black Hat was a lot about it. It's kind of buzzy. Um, so I want to talk about the current state of it and why it might actually start changing, not just because a lot of people are talking about it, but because Internet of Things is going to change some stuff that affects the reasons why we haven't had software product liability so far. So let's start out by comparing two different situations. Let's say you go to Target and you buy a coffee maker and you bring it home, you plug it in, and something happens. The glass carafe has a flaw in it and it explodes and cuts your wrists or it catches fire or something. In this instance, as a consumer, um, you might have medical bills and you can go to the person who made your coffee maker, um, sue them in a court and have them pay for your medical bills. This happens all the time with, uh, with defective products. And then let's compare that to another consumer who buys a router, she brings it home and plugs it into her home office and there's a flaw in the software on the router um, and all of her information gets exposed, she goes through identity theft and so forth. This consumer does not really have any recourse under our system right now. She's also been harmed, but she can't bring a suit. Or she could, but it'll probably get tossed out of court pretty quickly. So why? What is the actual difference between these two situations? We have two consumers who are harmed by products that they've bought, and they're facing fundamentally different situations in the court. So to start with that, I need to explain to you a little bit about how the American legal system works. So generally, if there's an agreement between two people as a contract, this is super common in the software world. We have click wraps, we have EULAs, we have terms of service, and essentially how the American legal system works is that if you have a contract and something happens, any um, sort of damages or so forth are going to be governed by this contract. So basically, unless there is some really grievous physical harm, what happens in that contract gets governed by that contract. On the other hand, you might get harmed by someone who you don't have an agreement with. We have car accidents, maybe a roller coaster goes flying off of the track. Uh, we use tort law to address that. Tort law is for when someone out there who you are not in an existing agreement with hurts you and it's how you have your medical bills paid for. And product liability law is a subset of tort law. It's the law that governs um, basically it purchases a product and if those products are defective. So let's think about what you need for a product liability suit in our legal system right now. You need more than what we call pure economic loss. You need a physical harm to the consumer, like that glass carafe exploded and cut your wrist or something, or you need property damage, maybe a coffee maker caught fire and it burned your kitchen. So now let's think about what happens with the Internet of Things. Software has always just been on our computers, and we've had buggy software, we've had problems caused by software, but it was not capable of causing any physical harm out in the real world. And this changes with IoT. We have software in fridges. If someone hacks into your fridge and raises the temperature of it, your food could go bad, it could cause you to get sick. We have software in drones, a drone could fall out of the sky and hurt you. This had been a really fundamental, um, or there's a, this really fundamental shift in the sorts of ways that software is going to be interacting with the real world that changes one of the fundamental assumptions that we've always had about why there is no such thing as software product liability. So this is not actually the first time that software or that product liability might be changing. So I'm gonna go all the way back to 1916. There's a very influential case that sort of developed the product liability as we know it today. It was called McPherson versus Buick. This guy went and he bought a car from a Buick dealership it's 1916, so for whatever reason at the time, they made wheels out of wood, and there was a flaw in one of his wooden wheels. He's driving down the road, and the wood breaks. Um, the car crashes, he's injured, and he goes back to his Buick dealer, and he's like, hey, you know, there was a problem with that car that I bought from you, and it injured me, and I'd like you to pay my medical bills. And the dealer goes, okay, well, sure, there was a flaw, but that came from the person who built your car. All I did was sell it to you, so essentially, the guy who bought the car and the seller were what we call in the legal world in privity. They had an agreement. 
but the guy who bought the car was not in privity with the person who built the car, who was also the person who introduced the defect. And so the court said, oh, we have a problem. This guy was injured, and he can't have his medical bills paid for. And as a society at that time, they were moving away from you know, everybody being a farmer, buying things in general stores, where you knew the person who was selling products to you, and they were shifting towards you know, mass production, um, supply chains, and so forth. And the court recognized that this was a change. And they decided to allow the guy who bought the Buick to go recover from the person who built the defective product. And so they developed the idea of um, basically the ability to go have your medical bills or whatever paid for from anyone who had built a, a product or sold it to you anywhere up and down that chain. So in the courts, we recognize three different types of defects. Um, these have all developed mostly since the, that 1916 case. We have manufacturing defect, which is probably what a lot of people think about when they think about defective products. That would be like that flaw in the glass of the coffee maker. This one instance of a product came off a factory line and there was a problem with it. We also have what we call a design defect. So maybe that coffee maker was built such that if it's on for more than three hours, it might overheat, it could catch fire, it could cause problems. And there's a little switch or something that the coffee maker manufacturer could have installed in the coffee maker, but chose not to. And so if it catches fire, the consumer can go into court and be like, hey, this is just a really poorly designed product. You probably should have put that switch in. It wouldn't have cost that much, and it would have eliminated the danger. And finally, we have failure to warn. Failure to warn is the reason why your McDonald's coffee cups say, warning, this is hot. Um, and why there's uh, stickers all over everything. Um, so in that instance, maybe we can say the coffee maker you know, has a tendency to overheat after 30 minutes, but we could just put a little sticker on it and tell the consumer, you know, don't leave this on for more than 30 minutes. And so that will allow the consumer to be aware of this problem and take action to prevent it. So product liability is what we call strict liability, which is liability without fault. And this sort of feeds into the question of, why can you go buy knives, but you can't buy lawn darts? If we think about it, these are both sharp objects that could injure you, and yet one is freely available in the American consumer market. And the reason is really risk utility balancing, and that is also the reason why product liability is not really strict liability. So foreseeability and obvious dangers really play a big part in this. So an obvious danger like the knife, you know, I can look at it and I can be like, yeah, I can see that this is something that could hurt me, but it's really useful. We need to be able to buy knives or, you know, I go home and cook dinner and I'm going to have a lot of problems preparing my dinner. Whereas lawn darts, they're fun, they're sharp, they're not super useful. Our society is kind of running without them right now. Um, the foreseeability also plays into how you use a product. So if I buy a stepladder and I decide to do something really dumb and set it up in a rowboat and I climb up on the stepladder in the rowboat and it collapses and I now broke my leg, if I go to the manufacturer and I'm like, hey, I was injured by you know, your stepladder, they're going to go, uh-uh. It's like, in a rowboat? No, not going to happen. Like That's completely not foreseeable you were doing something dumb there. Um, I could take a coffee maker, I could mount it on a drone because I want to be lazy and I want my coffee to come get delivered to me. <laughs> over on my sofa, and then someone hacks into the drone and causes it to you know, sort of wobble in the air and it dumps hot coffee on me. Like, that is a legit stupid thing to be doing. <laughs> you are not going to recover under any sort of scheme. Um, so some of the reasons why we have product liability, really, is that it serves an insurance function. Our society has decided to sort of push the burden of making products safe onto manufacturers rather than requiring every consumer to be their own you know, consumers research sort of people and have to go investigate whether these products are safe. You know, I can go to a Target, I can purchase a blender, and I'm not super concerned that this blender is really going to harm me because I have this reasonable expectation that if I buy this product and I use it in a fairly ordinary way, that it's going to be okay, it's not going to harm me. And this is something that might start changing with IoT. So the people who build blenders are totally used to building blenders. However, they are not really totally used to building software. We don't know right now um, how common it is for them to build blenders that can be upgraded. Do they have experience with accepting reports from the security community about vulnerabilities? Do they understand what sorts of 
uh, features they should put in to be secure. There have been things with like IoT tea kettles that were leaking Wi-Fi credentials because they were just poorly designed from a software side. And all of us are like, well, yeah, that's really stupid, you know. But we also have experience building software. These folks who are starting to put software into things that can interact with the world do not yet have that background. So this is kind of cool. We could empower consumers and they could use uh, software product liability. But that's a big fuzzy thing, like how would this actually work in a court? You can't just go into a court and be like, I feel like we should have this sort of uh, liability. So failure to warn is one framework we could use. And one way we could think specifically about it is that maybe software companies or companies that are using software should have to warn about known vulnerabilities. Failure to warn is a pretty well-developed field in product liability, and it really breaks down into two components. One of them is the risk reduction warning. Like if you're gonna use this chainsaw, wear goggles. We could think about that in a software world by saying, hey, if you're going to run this particular software, make sure that you, know, you upgrade the Java it's running on. You know, go do these particular configuration settings so that it's a little bit safer for you. Or we have informed choice warnings. The informed choice warning is incredibly common in the pharmaceutical world. We tell the consumer there are these risks out there. They exist. I'm just going to let you know about them and you need to make your own risk calculation. So you can think about that in the software world. We could say, well, the software has maybe this vulnerability and we're going to tell you about it and you need to make your own decision about whether it's important to your business to keep using this software and maybe you can figure out in your network how to set it up and protect it. And one of the uh, things we can think about is that failure to warn might provide incentives for better software development practices. We can think about encouraging the people who are making these internet-enabled smart fridges to design items that can get patched, um, following, for example, maybe the Open Web Application Security Project's top 10, if you're going to um, have like a, a web application for this sort of thing. We can talk about making it easy for researchers to disclose problems that they've found, rather than having to force them to go through endless CSQs triaging issues and releasing them. These are things that software companies are really used to. You know, we can get in a, uh, a bug report and decide whether it's a serious problem, it's exploitable, if it actually needs to be addressed or not. And that's something that companies that aren't used to building software are not used to doing. One part of failure to warn that we really should worry about if we're going to start thinking about this with vulner vulnerabilities is warning overload. Um, so this is a picture of my coffee maker covered with a million and a half hot warning <laughs> stickers. Like if I saw this, I would just be like, I don't even know where to touch this anymore. This is complete warning overload. Um, and we really worry about telling consumers too many things and so they take in no information and we're back at base zero. They haven't actually been effectively warned about anything. There's limited amounts of attention that people have. You need to think too about whether warnings are reasonable. You know, we all joke about that warning on the McDonald's coffee cup of warning, this is really hot. Like, okay, yes, I know it's hot. Do I actually still even read it? Should I have been warned about something else? If we think that consumers have limited amounts of intelligence and we tell them 30 different things, but we bury the most important warning in number 30, is that really an effective warning? And one that particularly concerns me um, with software vulnerabilities is what if we have people warn about unpatched vulnerabilities? You know, we got this report, we need to tell you about it, but we have no plans to patch. Is that just going to be a big like, hey, go reverse engineer this particular uh, thing over here? So, obvious risks. I love this image. Um, you might not be able to read it. It says, please make sure you have made the right decision. <laughs> it's a little ducky that I can plug in. <laughs> that is like the perfect warning. <laughs> Uh, so in failure to warn, you should have known is completely obvious. If you notice your kitchen knives at home, do not necessarily say warning sharp because you guys should all know that knives are sharp. <laughs> um, this also allows you to, it plays into that foreseeability of use thing when I was talking about, you know, like, hey, what if I use a step ladder and a rowboat and that's a dangerous thing to do? Um, if you just have bad security practices, you know, and that's the actual root cause of your harm, that's going to protect a software creator. So, people freak out a lot when they hear about software product liability and open source. It turns out that we can analogize to some existing product liability uh, doctrines. Um, so for one, 
there's a big focus on commercial sellers of product liability. You can't really go to like an Etsy seller and be like, hey, your product was defective. I mean, you could try, but you're, it's probably not going to go anywhere in the courts. Um, but the thing that is a little more important when we think about open source <coughs> is the component product liability. So product liability understands if you build a gear and it goes into a machine and the machine goes into a product and the consumer buys it and there's some problem like in the engine in this product, the person who built the gear that goes in is not really the person on which the liability is going to be pinned. Like yes, we have liability for the retailer, we have liability for even the supply chain, we have liability for the person who built and assembled the engine, but the component itself would be deemed to, you know, like, we'll say, okay, this little individual product here that just went into the larger defective product is not responsible for the harm, and therefore we can exclude them from liability. So we can take all of this and think about how does this relate to the way that we currently develop and patch software, especially as we're going to be putting these into IoT devices. So let's think about what happened after 1916 um, when we had our poor guy who bought the Buick and it you know, dumped him on the highway. Consumer safety really increased. Um, in large part, we got used to how to build things in factories. We developed standardized practices for mass uh, production. So the Buick case was kind of a, what we can think of as a trigger case. It caused the law to adjust because society had changed and we wanted to develop sort of this insurance function because it was going to allow us to sort of put the risk of these products onto people who we thought were in a better position to handle them. And this sort of shift could happen again with IoT. So with IoT, we're really now having software that can cause these physical harms. And physical harms are something that we're used to having liability for. Um, we can say, you know, right now a lot of IoT products are released with some pretty questionable security practices. A lot of them don't have the ability to patch. And using software product liability as a way to affect, um, basically as a lever to make those things safer, is something that might help us protect consumers. So this is so much not a perfect solution. There's tons of problems. Um, we talked about what happens if it's an unpatched vulnerability. Should we warn people about it? You know, like this might be this informed choice warning, like, hey, there's a bug over here. We want you to know about it um, before you decide to keep using it. A lot of times you say software liability and people go, oh my God, innovation. We're really concerned about that. That's something that has really driven our industry to be the success that it is. Um, and we don't want people in their garages or small companies to be burdened by um, this sort of scheme. We also, if we're going to warn about vulnerabilities, seriously need to worry about the warning overload fatigue. Um, anybody in this industry knows the number of security vulner vulnerability uh, announcements that are made and patches, and we joke about patch fatigue. This is actually a serious problem. So let's think about where do we go from here. Um, we do not necessarily have this sort of liability, but we do have a standard set of practices that a lot of us agree on. You should be testing. There are guidelines out there on how to improve your software development lifecycle. Um, people talk about using bug bounty programs. Um, generally, you should probably already be taking reasonable care to put safe products out in the marketplace. I'm probably preaching to the choir on this one. But if we did ever get this sort of liability, you could go be like, hey, I am following standard industry practices. There should be a presumption that I have fairly safe products here. So thank you very much. Um, I love talking about this sort of stuff. Uh, so come find me. And do I have time for questions? Yeah. Cool. So does anybody have questions? Yeah, awesome. <laughs> um, so uh, crystal ball, five years from now, what do you think the reasonable standard of care will be for IoT providers? For what providers? For people who make like these Internet of Things devices. Um, I think definitely. and. I am a web developer, so uh, most of my development experience comes from that, from working middleware services, whatever. But things like being able to patch, um, alerting people about you know, what vulnerabilities you have and what fixes are available, um, getting your stuff audited, um, doing code reviews, and following what's out there in the industry, like the open web application security guidelines is sort of you know, well agreed upon things that you should be checking for, um, red teaming your products and so forth. You know, I don't know specifically what they will be, but we're moving towards consensus for a lot of these things, and courts will look to that sort of thing and say, what does the industry think is fairly standard? Uh, just curious, what's your take on 
you know, uh, the whole Tesla crash with, oh. you know, ha ha that kind of is a really interesting wrapper of software and, you know, consumer products. So just curious. Yeah. I am not super familiar with the Tesla crash. Um, I did literally just spend three months locked away with law books studying for the bar. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is something where they need to be making sure that this is a safe product they put into the consumer hands. Um, if a consumer gets something and can use it in a completely unexpected way and some harm happens, like I'm not that concerned if the consumer is using it in what would be a fairly normal, reasonable way and there's a bug and it causes a problem, that's where we would start looking and say like, well, can we go say, you know, this is a vulnerability, this is the sort of thing that liability would help protect the consumer for. But it's hard. What happens in the courts a lot is it's a lot of sort of risk utility balancing. It's a lot of economics that goes into it. Like, how much would it have cost them to make something that is really safe? I mean, like, cars are unsafe. Cars are not square boxes of square wheels built out of 100 tons of steel because that would be safe. But it would be unusable and expensive. And like, our society has decided where we want to place the risk on that. And we need to move towards that in an IoT sort of world. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, any comments on Mudge and Sarah Zetko's Cyber UL as part of yes. trying to beat the insurance companies into doing stuff? Uh, that's actually a really good sort of um, indication of the kind of thing that our industry should be doing to move towards what's accepted practices. You know, they're going to be putting out like labels and saying these are safer versus less safe. Um, that fits perfectly in with this kind of thing. And I think it's awesome that more companies should be doing this sort of auditing of stuff out there. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, would it wash if a company said, warning, this product uses a default username or a default admin username and password combination? Please do not expose to <laughs> yeah. public internets. FYI, we're doing something stupid. Uh, <laughs> it's sad to say that actually does work a lot of times. But on the other hand, we don't have lawn darts. You know, it, what happens is you'll have these outlier court cases that will say yes and outlier court cases that say no. And then the way the law works in uh, the U.S. is it kind of builds towards this consensus. And that kind of happens, you know, as juries who are the ones who decide this. So I could buy, time by, warning, so I could buy time by saying warning, we're doing something incredibly stupid. <laughs> You're aware of it. You took on yes. the risk. <laughs> Courts do actually recognize that sort of thing. So, well, Lawn darts ever make a comeback? <laughs> <laughs> IoT lawn darts. Like there you go. Uh, Wi-Fi lawn darts. Okay. It, it could. I mean, so New Jersey actually outlawed uh, swimming pools as being unnecessary, like completely unreasonably dangerous in about the 1970s. And you can buy swimming pools and install them in New Jersey, so courts realize their their failure. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Great. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, guys.